Hey internet friends! Once upon a time, there existed an empire so great, it extended all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Euphrates River. But the rulers of this empire were greedy, and their political structure corrupt. The sheer size of their territory, claimed through wars of conquest, proved difficult to govern, the borders challenging to secure, relying on slaves as soldiers, guards, and laborers. So the leadership implemented oppressive taxation, funneling more and more money into the military, letting the blood flow for their pagan gods. And when this decadent empire eventually buckled under the weight of its own greed, the elite fled, leaving behind their mighty legacy, reduced to only a mound of rubble and a few choice paragraphs in high school world history books. The American media, which is a proven and documented extension of the government, refuses to address the obvious parallels between the fall of the Roman Empire and America's current reality. The decline in moral values, resulting in incompetent and corrupt leadership, the overexertion of the military in foreign lands, excess spending, aggressive taxation, inflation, and the ever-widening gap between the rich and the poor. But why would the American government want to keep its citizens in the dark about its decline? Going through a great deal of effort and cranking out propaganda for every new medium and indoctrinating young minds with a lackluster education system. Certainly, if most Americans knew about the state of their nation, at least a small percentage of them would want to work together to find a solution. After all, we are a nation which largely descended from immigrants and revolutionists people who rejected injustice and challenged tyranny. That's why today we're going to discuss what the media won't tell us about the United States of America. If there's one common thread that connects the empires of the past, it's the characteristics of their fall. Corrupted by power, perversion, and bloodlust, infecting the minds of the sovereign, destroying the empire from within. But instead of erupting into flames, the Eastern Roman Empire smoldered all the way until 1453 AD only 40 years before Christopher Columbus sailed to America. Colonization of the Americas is often exemplified by the story of the pilgrims arriving at Plymouth in the early 1600s, with the first colony at Jamestown established to find gold and spice, followed by the Puritans, then slaves brought over against their will, and of course, an influx of newcomers seeking economic opportunity. The majority of that opportunity which was thwarted post-American Civil War, leaving the American economy in the hands of a powerful few. In 1862, when the Civil War was still waging on, Sidney Morse, the brother of famous inventor Samuel Morse, wrote a piece exposing the war as a British plot to enslave America's entire free population to the moneylenders. American philosopher and writer Lysander Spooner reiterated Morse's claims in his book, no treason, stating that the British aristocracy, which at its heart is the Rothschild banking family, orchestrated the Civil War to divide America in half. And it worked. Black people were slaves, white people were slaves. Our history on the Civil War is very misguided. The United States was bankrupt and vulnerable after the Civil War, and seeing an opportunity to make a dollar and lay a foundation for future plans, the Rothschilds and other European financiers made credit available to the American government in the aftermath of the Civil War as a means to, one, fight President Lincoln's greenback after Lincoln was assassinated for wanting the people to control their own monetary system instead of the Rothschild bankers, and two, collect interest from those who desperately needed the money, which would be the United States government at the time. In 1910, there was a secret gathering at Jekyll Island, Georgia which laid the foundation for the Federal Reserve System. The meeting took place right on top of the Canaanite blood altar on the island, which I know sounds totally crazy, but underneath the Vatican is a pagan altar as well, with pagan idols like Medusa, though in the Vatican's case, these pagan idols are attributed to the Roman cult Mithras. But I digress. By 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed, handing over America's gold and silver reserves and ultimately the total control of America's economy to the Federal Reserve Bank. In other words, a private corporation established their private bank, acting as the central bank of the United States. But it isn't even a government institution, but a privately owned banking system, the existence of which is unconstitutional. The Federal Reserve controls the rise and the fall or the boom and the bust of these financial cycles. That's been the pattern of this unconstitutional system since its implementation. The Fed controls the dollar to flood the market and starve the economy, causing regular people to lose everything, sending families into generations of debt, 
We as Americans do not control our own currency, but a foreign system does. It's the new slavery. Well, it's really an old practice with a facelift, Babylon debt slavery. The Federal Reserve is a hybrid organization. It's a partnership between the federal government and the private banks. When you look at it deeper than that, its essence is neither as a government agency or a private company. In reality, it is a cartel. So what's the purpose of the secrecy? It's because when you look at the list of these people who went, they were the representatives of the banks, J.P. Morgan, the Rockefellers, they represented Kuhn Loeb and Company, Warburgs in Germany and the Netherlands, and the Rothschilds in England. This was the money trust, not only of the United States, but of the world. So why, if the Civil War was fought over slavery, are we still slaves? Do you own your car? Do you own your home? Have you paid off those student loans for that fancy college degree that you earned under the impression that it was a stepping stone to this elusive American dream that you have to be asleep for in order to experience? And consequently, the federal government went essentially bankrupt in the 1930s. While social security numbers started being assigned in 1936, tracking lifetime earnings in the number of years individuals have worked. During this time, the United States entered wars funded by bankers on both sides, the outcome of which was the destruction of the Ottoman Empire, the creation of the Zionist State of Israel, and the establishment of one global government. In our history books, we're told that Germany was the biggest loser of World War II, yet we're not really told the full reality. The Vatican supported Hitler, and boy oh boy was Hitler a fan of ancient Rome. Former American Senator Prescott Bush funded the Nazis in the 1930s through the Union Bank, meaning that Americans gave rise to Hitler. If Germany really was the biggest loser of World War II, why did prominent Germans and Nazis become integrated into the American government with the space program and Operation Paperclip? Why does the CIA continue to utilize experiments and procedures that mirror that of Dr. Mengele's? Is Dr. Mingala the Dr. Green that numerous American MK Ultra victims reference? I'm Christy Nicola, born July of 1962, rendering me 32 years of age. I was a subject in radiation as well as mind control and drug experiments performed by a man I knew as Dr. Green. Arguments have surfaced defending Hitler's intentions pre-World War II, asserting that Hitler just wanted the best for the German people, for their economy. But Hitler knew of the Balfour Declaration of 1917, the document that promised Lord Rothschild a Zionist state in Palestine. So why did Hitler allow himself to be pushed into World War II by Great Britain? He knew what would happen. He knew exactly what the Rothschild bankers funding both sides of the war wanted. Doesn't this make Hitler the biggest Zionist ever by accident or, or by design? Since the end of World War II, the United States has only seen more war. The US military is in every foreign land imaginable, with young Americans being used as cannon fodder, like cattle for slaughter. Just like in ancient Rome, the United States sends the military to foreign lands, not to protect our own land, but to pursue these wars of conquest. The US allegedly fights wars for peace, but takes the spoils, like the oil. American currency once had strength because the global oil transactions were executed in the American dollar. But times are changing. China and its allies are ditching the petrodollar in favor of their own currency, which is convertible into gold. The industry once powered by the American dollar is now rivaled by a foreign currency, slowly stomping out the power that the dollar once held, which will impact regular old Americans the most. A dozen eggs cost 25 cents in 1971. Today, $1.68 is the price. But we don't get any more eggs. And on top of that, according to a 2017 report from Bankrate, nearly 6 in 10 Americans don't have enough savings to cover a $500 or $1,000 unplanned expense. Yet the Fed continues to print as much money as they deem fit, its value created from thin air. All of our news, as well as our declining education system, is designed to keep us ignorant. Ignorant from the fact that the Fed is a parasite on America. Our government is at the will of foreign lobbyists. The Vatican is a superpower. Hollywood is a circus. The breaking news headlines are a distraction. Most colleges are now daycares, expensive ones. And agendas are being implemented every day to divide us over race, religion, politics, and gender. 
Because the Empire doesn't want us to know the truth. And the truth is, evil is a master of disguise. Crypto-Jew, crypto-Nazi, crypto-Christian, crypto-Muslim, whatever. Throughout history, the mask has changed, but the pattern has not. Will the masses ever awaken from their American dream? Or will history continue to repeat itself, time after time? And this is my opinion, but I want to make it clear that I believe as Americans, we have it really good by comparison. But in my lifetime, I've never known a moment when America was not at war. I grew up learning only the answers for standardized tests, with questions beyond, what kind of pencil can I use to fill out the Scantron, left unanswered by my teachers. Being told that college was the well-worn path to the American dream. But does the American dream still exist? Did it, did it ever exist? Hey internet friends, history is littered with tales of individuals devising new ways to kill each other. Throughout the centuries, the deliberate use of bacteria, viruses, and toxins has been proven as an effective means of neutralizing a targeted population, a practice that has been dubbed biological warfare. Fast forward to recent times and poisoning the well with plague-ridden corpses just doesn't quite cut it anymore. Especially not for empires whose culture is rooted in endless war. After all, the war machine requires the latest and greatest. But while the bioterrorism budget is booming, the pool of volunteers willing to test out the effectiveness of these weapons is anything but. That's why today we're going to blast back to the past and examine the lessons of history, focusing on a handful of unethical human experiments that we know about, as well as the global government, organizations, and individuals who carried out these barbaric experiments by means of deception powerful entities still around today who demand the blind trust of the general populace, though the only established track record that they hold is one of total disregard for human life. Today we're going to talk about a selection of horrific human experiments carried out under the American flag. Number 1. The Filipino Prison Experiments Found within the first book of Samuel in the Bible is the oldest account of what is speculated to be the bubonic plague. The story goes a little something like this. When the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant from the Israelites, the Philistines were afflicted by an epidemic of what was later thought to be the plague, the symptoms affecting each town to which the Ark of the Covenant was taken. The link was established by mentions of what was later roughly translated to mean rats and buboes or tumors and further established by the knowledge that humans can be infected by fleas who have fed on infected rodents. The Philistines returned the Ark of the Covenant in repentance and offered five golden tumors and five golden mice to end the plague. But that wouldn't be the last time that a disease, thought to be naturally occurring, would be weaponized. In the late 19th century, the United States military along with the universities began medical experiments on prisoners in the Philippines which was, at the time, an American territory. These experiments included injecting prisoners with the bubonic plague, beginning with five select prisoners for the first round. Later, Yale and Johns Hopkins University graduate, Professor Richard Strong infected 24 prisoners with what he reportedly thought to be cholera, but turned out to be somehow contaminated with bubonic plague, killing 13 of those prisoners. Whoopsie daisy. Well, to his credit, Dr. Strong argued that he was thoroughly convinced that man could withstand the same amount of plague organism as a guinea pig. Dr. Strong was later found innocent of any criminal negligence, and he later had a thriving career as a professor of topical medicine at Harvard. But his experiments on prisoners didn't end with accidental plague inoculations. A few years later, he conducted another round of experiments, this time dealing with beriberi, a deficiency disease resulting in paralysis and ultimately heart failure. Although several prisoners died as a result, the remaining few were rewarded with cigars and cigarettes. What a reward for nearly escaping death, right? So worth it. To make matters worse, it's not like these prisoners volunteered for these experiments or even had the slightest clue as to what was going on which begins our theme of non-existent voluntary or informed consent, at least for this video. Number two, the Tuskegee syphilis study. 
Conducted by the Public Health Service in partnership with the Rockefeller-funded Tuskegee Institute in 1932, the clinical study of untreated syphilis targeted 600 African-American men, Alabama sharecroppers who believed they were receiving free health care from the United States government. Of the 600, 399 of those men had reportedly already contracted syphilis, a sexually transmitted disease, before the study began, and the remaining men were purposely infected with the bacterium told they were being treated for bad blood. The projected six-month clinical study spanned over the course of 40 years, and for many of those men, clinicians followed them until their eventual deaths. Though penicillin became the treatment of choice for syphilis in 1945, measuring the effectiveness of treatments wasn't the goal of this study. No, the goal of this 40-year study was to observe the consequences of untreated syphilis. And, spoiler alert, while syphilis often presents with a painless red sore at the infection site, when untreated, syphilis can cause damage to the internal organs, like the brain or the heart, and progresses through stages serious enough to result in death. It wasn't until much later that the horrors of the Tuskegee study surfaced, and a legal settlement included a lifetime of, wait for it, medical benefits to the study subjects, their wives, and children. Number three. The Devil's Experiments in Guatemala Dubbed the Devil's Experiment by Guatemalans, a series of venereal disease experiments took place in Guatemala between 1946 and 1948, and was led by physician James Charles Cutler, who was also involved in the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. The Guatemalan experiments involved infecting an estimated 1,308 unsuspecting victims with an STD. But this time, instead of just targeting African American men, the pool of victims opened up to children as young as 10, mental patients, prisoners, prostitutes, and soldiers. There were 80 documented deaths as a result. These experiments were reportedly conducted so researchers could look for ways to prevent STDs from spreading, with their focus on stopping the spread of diseases amongst soldiers at war. Guatemala was chosen so doctors could avoid the pesky ethical constraints of informed consent. Studies show that a number of patients were infected with syphilis and brought to the brink of death, only to test the effectiveness of penicillin as treatment. Once treated, patients were infected with yet another STD, and the process started over again. Dr. Cutler acknowledged his ethical violations in 1947, stating, Unless the law winks occasionally, you have no progress in medicine. Since the United States owned up to these experiments in 2010, there have been several lawsuits against the United States government, the Rockefeller-funded Johns Hopkins University, and the Rockefeller Foundation to the tune of $1 billion in damages. But the real damage has yet to come to fruition, given that there's no telling how many infected Guatemalan children and grandchildren of these victims are running around right now. The reverberations and consequences of these experiments resulting in generational effects, given that mothers can pass syphilis to an unborn child, and when left untreated, there's a high risk of stillbirth or infant death. Beyond the threat of lawsuits, those who conducted these experiments got nothing more than a slap on the wrist, if that. The Rockefeller Foundation is still just as influential as before, steering the medical community as it deems fit, because deep pockets have sway and can even rewrite history. If knowledge of unethical human experimentation was commonplace and everyone knew that the major pharmaceutical companies of today were the heads of the United States Biological Warfare Program of days past, like George Merck of Merck & Co., now a major vaccine maker, if individuals held this knowledge, would they still accept inoculations without asking their doctor or researching what they're putting in their bodies first? When I see recent headlines about how syphilis cases are at an all-time high, it makes me wonder how organic of an occurrence that is, and how much of the problem has been created to strike fear and outrage in the masses, so that a manufactured solution like a vaccine can be introduced to create profit, a solution with its own host of problems, a solution concocted by those with a sordid history, unworthy of your blind trust, as their only proven track record is one of disregard for human life. Number 4. The Ohio Penitentiary Cancer Experiments A man who eventually became the vice president of the American Cancer Society began his reign of terror in an Ohio state penitentiary in 1952. Chester Southam, a Sloan Kettering researcher, an institution which was unsurprisingly also funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, I know I sound like a broken record at this point, 
Anyway, Southam sought to discover how healthy bodies fought the invasion of malignant cells. So he injected live cancer cells into prisoners as well as 300 healthy women at Sloan Kettering, all of whom were not informed of Southam's extracurricular research. However, at the time, doctors were fully aware that injection of live cancer cells might cause cancer, even in healthy individuals. Nearly a decade later, Southam set his sights on 22 elderly patients at a chronic disease hospital in Brooklyn, injecting them with live cancer cells, all without their consent. Why? Well, he wanted to test his hypothesis, of course. His hypothesis was that bodies racked with serious but non-cancerous diseases would reject live cancer cells as rapidly and completely as healthy bodies. This time, a few whistleblower colleagues came forward, refusing to participate in Southam's experiments and ultimately resigning. His unethical practices eventually made headlines and even saw the inside of a courtroom. And his punishment? Brace yourselves for this one, it's a real doozy. The New York Medical Licensing Board put him on probation for a year. Number five, Operation Sea Spray. During the World Wars, the funding of the United States biological weapons programs increased, and it continued well into the Cold War. In 1950, a secret experiment was conducted by the U.S. Navy in an effort to test the vulnerability of susceptible regions of the United States in the event of a biological attack. The Navy sprayed clouds of serratia bacterium from a giant hose for two miles along the San Francisco Bay coastline successfully dosing nearly 800,000 residents during the week of spring, all unbeknownst to the general populace. Though the Navy claimed the bacteria was harmless, the reality is it can cause urinary tract and wound infections in some, as well as gastrointestinal and respiratory issues in others. The week following Operation Sea Spray, 11 adults checked in the hospital with serious UTIs linked to the bacteria, and even one man died as a result. Furthermore, an increase in pneumonia in the Bay Area was later speculated to have been linked to Operation Sea Spray. So are you wondering about the results of the experiment? San Francisco Bay was identified as highly susceptible to biological attacks due to its iconic fog. Pentagon reports that were declassified decades later revealed that the military had performed open-air testing of biowarfare agents an estimated 239 times across American cities like New York City, Panama City, and Key West from 1950 to 1966. Other reports detailed the release of deadly nerve agents over Alaska and dousing Hawaii with bacteria. And these experiments were not limited to the United States but extended all the way to Canada and even Great Britain. After these reports were declassified, the Defense Department admitted that the tests weren't exactly harmless. And due to the exposure to deadly chemicals and bacteria, soldiers and civilians alike have suffered serious health ramifications. It was in 1969 that President Richard Nixon issued an executive order to end all U.S. offensive biological weapons programs and supposedly all U.S. stockpiles were destroyed by 1972. However, as y'all will see in my upcoming videos, experimentation on human guinea pigs certainly didn't end in 1969, nor was it limited to germ warfare. Now, if you're someone who has watched this video all the way through and is hammering away on your keyboard right now to make the argument that, despite how unethical and brutal these experiments in this video were, the results provided pharmaceutical companies, physicians, and the military with information they needed. Before you comment that, I'd like to ask you something. Are you willing to volunteer yourself, your mother, your father, or your children as test subjects for the next round of experiments? From its fruition, the United States of America represented a breakaway from regimentation, defying what was, at the time, the greatest military on Earth. This new world was the stomping ground for early pioneers to seek meaning in the great unknown, to discover purpose in the face of new challenges, and to achieve the unachievable. In the beginning, there was the individual. There were families. There were communities. And then, rather suddenly, the new world regressed into the ways of old. Cycling backwards with the advent of compulsory schooling under a central government monopoly. Conditioning warehouse children to grow into warehouse adults. 
Instead of a childhood spent wandering around the world's classroom, engaging in adventure, seeking mentorship, and discovering purpose, as children had done in centuries previous, children of the present are confined to an institution for 12 years of their lives, subjected to constant surveillance and evaluation under the guise of learning basic skills. Even though there is ample evidence to prove that reading, writing, and arithmetic take a couple hundred hours to transmit on an eager student, not a dozen years. So who benefits from public schooling? Who is orchestrating a system which rewards the obedient, but medicates and punishes those who deviate even in the slightest? Who is funding this hidden curriculum? The link between school and state was established in pre-Socratic Greece. Back in the day, the goal of schooling was to mold young boys into obedient warriors, with the system promoted and supported by the upper echelon of society. In the prominent military city-state of Sparta, compulsory schooling was enforced by forcibly taking young boys from their mothers and training them for 12 years under state-controlled supervision. Fast forward to the year 1717, when a national public school system was instituted in Europe by the Kingdom of Prussia. The power of that school system was harnessed after Prussia's defeat at the hands of Napoleon with Prussia attributing their loss to disobedient soldiers. In order to compete with Great Britain and other imperial powers, Prussia sought to increase the state's hold on society. The result was that parents were fined if they failed to send their child to school. This method of compulsory public schooling served as a means of ensuring the state's position as guardian over the children during their key developmental years. Students were divided by age, like one would group products by date of manufacture, and these students moved through school like an assembly line, specific information being delivered at specific times, with the final product being a predictable and easy to control herd. While the origins of public school in the United States can be traced back to 1647 Massachusetts, private and decentralized schooling reigned supreme in the New World. It was the parents' responsibility to provide their child with a basic education, but in many cases, the responsibility of education shifted from parents to local communities which would hire a schoolmaster to teach the children to read and write. Private schools and educators were subject to competition, forcing these institutions and individuals to provide unique value to students. Despite the notion that folks were by and large illiterate back in the day, recorded book sales of that time tell a much different story. Noah Webster's spelling book sold 5 million copies to an estimated population of 20 million in 1818. Thomas Paine's Common Sense pamphlet sold 120,000 copies to a colonial population of 3 million. So when career politician Horace Mann arrived on the scene and lobbied for a Prussian-inspired model of compulsory schooling and training schools for teachers, it wasn't out of society's inability to provide private and sufficient education for a spectrum of social classes. Instead, a perfect storm emerged in the decades leading up to the American Civil War that created an ideal atmosphere to introduce state control of public schooling. And it went a little something like this. When man met machine during the Industrial Revolution, agricultural communities dwindled, and families migrated to the city to find work. The fallout of which was the dismantling of the family economy, the destruction of small, self-sufficient local communities, an ever-growing dependency on remote authority, and the emergence of a new nobility. Industrial titans and family names we still recognize in answer to, to this day. You see, families of big industry like the Carnegies and the Rockefellers had learned a valuable lesson from history. They realized the industrial poor who were barely earning a living wage in their warehouses and factories were the revolutionists of days past. They knew that in order to maintain control over their human cattle, their herd needed to be tended and cultivated, otherwise revolution, and perhaps even a little competition, was inevitable. Shortly after the Civil War, the Department of Education was established as the federal office but quickly downgraded in response to the concern over federal encroachment in state matters. By 1890, most states had implemented a oppression-inspired compulsory public school system, and it was during that time that corporate interests set their sights on a new venture, the business of education. Philanthropy is, by definition, the desire to promote the welfare of others, expressed especially by the generous donation of money to good causes. 
It should be stated that philanthropic institutions have undoubtedly done some good for someone out there. But if we study the patterns of history, an obvious truth emerges. Philanthropy is essential for establishing familial power. In the case of the Rockefellers, philanthropy has served as a vehicle to shape public reputation. And this favorable reputation has proved more powerful than any tool that could be purchased. The illusion of benevolence allows select families, not elected officials, sway over public affairs. Furthermore, money given away to foundations can be given away to produce profit for the family, whilst deducting those donations from their taxes. More money into the well-oiled machine of compulsory schooling, which pushes a curriculum of rewritten history, memorization of fake facts, and the lessening of the individual with the goal of cranking out predictable adults to serve as employees and consumers, which means a wealth of income for corporate families who invest in education. The founding brothers of the Rockefeller oil monopoly, whose father was called Devil Bill as he was a well-known con artist and snake oil salesman, funneled $129 million into the creation of the General Education Board, which shaped our current schooling system. The Rockefellers and the Carnegie Foundations were key in managing schools specifically for African Americans in the South, using their private wealth to shape race relations. Meanwhile, the philanthropic Rockefeller Foundation began to fund medicine and medical studies in tandem with actively participating in the funding of eugenics in the U.S. as well as globally. They were a primary financer of an institute that served as the Center for Eugenics Research until 1939. As a side note, how many Rockefeller children do you reckon attended public school over the last century? How many of our presidents or vice presidents attended public school? And how many attended private, elite boarding schools, where the curriculum was focused on problem-solving ability, the relationship between past, present, and future, and an emphasis on debate with the goal of producing a confident, innovative student? While the public school system was initially intended to be controlled by local governments within the states, as the years progressed, corporate advocates pushed for more consolidation and greater centralization of education. The full-on government takeover of taxpayer-funded education didn't all happen at once, of course. There were actually people within our government who attempted to intervene. It was in 1952 that an investigative committee looked into tax-exempt organizations, like the Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations, to see if they were being used to support communism, or really, oligarchical collectivism. Coincidentally, the chairman of the committee, Edward Cox, died the same year the committee was formed. It should be noted that the committee itself disbanded prematurely and without action despite its findings, which revealed that foundations had been using their influence to rewrite American history found in public school textbooks. However, the corporations running these foundations with interlocking board members managed to dodge any repercussions of their subversive activities by claiming the committee was criticizing free thought. In fact, the same year the committee released their findings, a member of the Rockefeller family, Nelson Rockefeller, became the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, and he later went on to be the Vice President of the United States. In 1979, Congress decided once again to create a Federal Department of Education. Presidential candidate Ronald Reagan campaigned on the promise to abolish the department, but when he eventually took office and submitted a proposal to do so, nothing happened. It was later revealed by Reagan's senior policy advisor in the Department of Education that the groundwork for a Washington-controlled Common Core curriculum had been laid in the 1960s. That plan was expedited under George H.W. Bush's presidency when he pushed for national goals to be instituted at the state level for public schools. This plan was reinforced by President Clinton and totally cemented by George W. Bush when he signed the No Child Left Behind Act in 2001, which placed federal control over school standards, student testing, and teacher qualifications. Furthermore, the Common Core Educational Initiative was instituted in 2010 that implemented more national standards about what children should know at each grade level. And these standards are of course measured by testing. This legislation was accomplished by private companies who had channeled millions of dollars into the education lobby for standardized testing. When students failed those tests and teachers failed to teach to those tests, the answer was for the US government to spend taxpayer money on materials sold by the same private companies who lobbied for the tests to begin with. This is the Hegelian dialectic of the education business. 
and it has been effective in solidifying corporate control over schooling, as well as churning out a bulk of the population who is alike, as they have been tested on the same material which was taught to them at the same time in the same format at the same juncture of all their lives. Over the last few decades, the Rockefeller, Ford, and Carnegie foundations have been joined by other corporate juggernauts in their domination of the student's mind. Though it should be noted that while a distinction between these foundations exists, they all have interlocking board members and incestuous connections. The Walton family of the Walmart empire, with its talons also in central banking, has invested over a billion dollars in the education system, only surpassed by the Gates Foundation, headed by Bill and Melinda Gates of Microsoft, who, like the Rockefellers, not only deals in alleged eugenics programs disguised as medical research, but also directly funds Common Core, paying to develop the standards and the tests. Is the Gates Foundation doing this out of the goodness of their heart, or do they own a stake in the big data businesses to which the Department of Education directs the bulk of its outsourcing? To top it all off, Pearson, a British textbook company, is the primary provider of textbooks for United States public schools. So to summarize, we have a British monopoly teaching American students about American history and other subjects. We have a public school system controlled by a government monopoly, which is financed and controlled by global corporate monopolies, all of which are tied to the central banking system. If we follow the money from start to finish, Corporate control of the public school system was made possible in the aftermath of the Civil War, during which Congress passed the Act of 1871, providing a government for the 10-mile parcel of land between Virginia and Maryland, the Virgin Mary we now call the District of Columbia, a city-state with its own police force, mayor, and its own set of laws. The Act of 1871 changed our country's founding father's original wording of the Constitution, and ultimately overturned the United States Constitutional Republic. Since 1871, the federal government has usurped nearly all the power that was formerly held in the hands of the people. Within the context of an incorporated United States, it would make sense that each citizen is assigned a social security number at birth that tracks earnings and years worked. Like a less intrusive brand than cattle receive, but a marking of property nonetheless. The compulsory school system of an incorporated United States enforces students to obey the state, with the student-teacher relationship mirroring that of employee and supervisor. Further proof of this model is mirrored in the grading system. A successful student doesn't equate to an intelligent, innovative student, but a successful student is a compliant student who exemplifies obedience rather than actual knowledge or critical thinking because a corporation doesn't want competition or the slightest threat of revolution. A corporation wants an obedient worker. Compulsory education is compulsory subordination. This system is the very antithesis of education, and children of today have it even worse than previous generations. These children are now under constant surveillance and evaluation. These children are trained to wait on other people, for experts to tell them what to do, to pay attention until there is another distraction, and the distractions are endless. Students have no privacy at home either. Hours of homework follow them to the dinner table. The programming they consume in their downtime, the television, the video games, the good portion of the YouTube videos, all enforce the indoctrination taught at school to believe in the infallibility of authority. The majority of children in the school system right now will grow into adults who are absolutely incapable of telling any form of authority what they want, and instead they will accept what they get. Teachers of the present have to function as surrogate parents because a portion of their students in their overcrowded classrooms are lacking one or both parents at home. And these teachers cannot teach at a higher level than the textbook due to the ubiquity of standardized tests. The reality is there is no reform for the system. It's a system that operates exactly as it was designed. Any amount of energy or anger directed at the human farmers of the system is unproductive and ultimately a distraction. And the purpose of this video is not to encourage violence or negativity towards the corporate monopoly, only awareness. The only way not to be treated as human cattle is to leave the farm, which means refusing to allow the state to raise your child. Whether that be through homeschooling, private school, or just taking the time out of your day to foster your child's creativity, to unschool them to the best of your ability, and to teach them that the last thing they are is cattle.
Locked on target. Hey, Internet friends. We are living in the age of technology, an age in which vast amounts of information are at our fingertips, and we can connect with each other in just a few keystrokes. The World Wide Web is stuffed like a Thanksgiving turkey, full of an endless buffet of distractions, breaking news headlines, advertisements masquerading as entertainment, and a seemingly infinite trove of ever-evolving information, from which the elusive truths of this world are the greatest treasure. So that's why today we're going to discuss how the internet became a battlefield and the war on our minds. The father of psychoanalysis was born in the Austrian Empire in 1856 to Eastern European Jewish parents. It was in Vienna that Sigmund Freud researched and experimented on the human mind, concluding that man was the most ferocious animal in existence and tucked inside the minds of all of these animals were primitive sexual and aggressive forces. Forces that had the power to unleash widespread chaos and even the potential to topple governments. While Freud warned that governments had set loose these dangerous forces with World War I, Freud's American nephew, Edward Bernays, had been employed to keep the war drums beating. President Woodrow Wilson needed Americans to get on board with the war machine, and he turned to propagandists to do just that to convince Americans to join the fight under the guise of spreading democracy across all of Europe, so that a hopeful future might unfold, one where individuals across the world could experience good old American freedom. But Bernays wasn't too keen on the propagandist title. He claimed, ironically, that the Germans had tainted the term, and thus, he reinvented it, emerging as the father of public relations. You see, Bernays had witnessed firsthand how powerful propaganda was at promoting war. So for his next act, Bernays decided to use propaganda, I mean, public relations, to promote peace. How, you might ask, did Bernays execute such a noble deed? Well, his uncle, who, by the way, hated humans, especially Americans, had some interesting ideas on human nature, and Bernays decided it was time to weaponize those ideas. For peace, of course. For peace. American corporations emerged even more powerful after the First World War, and in order to maintain their cash flow, and in other words, their influence, business owners realized they needed to keep their workers in the factories to increase their production. And of course, there is no supply without demand. That's why Bernays big business clients hired him to figure out exactly what motivated the human mind, so corporations could better appeal to the masses. The year was 1928 when the president of the American Tobacco Company looked to Bernays to increase sales, providing Bernays with an opportunity to conduct an experiment of sorts. This was a time when women smoking in public was stigmatized, but both Bernays and his client knew an untapped market when they saw one. Bernays employed psychoanalysis, learning that cigarettes symbolized the penis, therefore male sexual power, and he figured out that if he could connect smoking cigarettes to the idea of challenging male sexual power, he could sell a pack of smokes to both genders. Everyone was a winner, but their lungs were not. So at the Easter Day Parade, Bernays set up a huge publicity stunt. He'd already tipped off the press and supplied them with their new propaganda piece, I mean, public relations phrase, Torches of Freedom, which the press would then capture when a group of paid-off debutantes posing as suffragettes lit up their cigarettes in the middle of the parade, making the single act of igniting a torch of freedom a gesture of female empowerment, wrapped up in one stinky PR package meant to render emotion from all who might look upon it, skyrocketing tobacco sales and forever linking human desire and feelings with products because it's not like the actual act of becoming a human chimney made women any freer, but it sure made him feel like it. And with this realization, Bernays felt confident that his tactics could emotionally manipulate the masses to purchase product on the basis of want, not need. And all these dangerous primitive forces his uncle was droning on about were made even more docile through Bernays' manipulation of habits and opinions. Bernays had successfully remixed the Romans' bread and circuses. The average Joe was so occupied, in fact, that most didn't even realize a new mentality, shaped by corporate appeal, was binding and guiding America, creating a clear path for a new elite to control the masses through psychological techniques, forming a grand illusion of this thing we now call democracy.
Though traditional warfare had ended with World War II, the psychological warfare of an unseen enemy was just getting started. The masses were led to believe the world's boogeyman had been defeated, and that a global government organization, the United Nations, had been established to ensure peace and security in the aftermath of all the horror. Post-war United States was as strong as ever, with its workforce fueled by the American dream, at the center of which was family. But out of the rubble and ruin of battle rose a subversive force, one of many names and faces. Communism, cultural Marxism, Soviet involvement, Big Brother. Regardless of the title, the goal of this variety of psychological warfare was one of a new world order, brought about by a slow roll brainwashing of sorts, known as ideological subversion, made up of four stages. Stage one, demoralization, which begins in the classroom. Instead of teaching children to act morally in favor of themselves, their families, their communities, and their country, under the process of ideological subversion, demoralization takes place over a generation, where, in compulsory public schooling, a manipulated account of history is branded in the brains of every pupil, and unrighteous behavior is encouraged at school through television programming and other vehicles of propaganda. These lessons are reinforced at the university level, resulting in brainwashed cattle at every level of power government, business, media, and education. If stage one is successful, the individual's perception of reality is so warped that any attempts to get them to recognize authentic information would be to no avail. After that, all that's needed is a good two to five years in order to implement stage two, the destabilization of a nation. This is the time that subverting party has the opportunity to crash the economy, ruin foreign relations, and disarm the defense systems just in time for phase three the crisis phase, intended to usher in a change of power. Brownie points if it's a violent and dramatic change of power. The final stage is normalization, which is the welcome to your life as human cattle, please line up to get branded phase. Which might sound like a slight exaggeration, al although if you think about it, not really. It's kind of curious that while all this ideological subversion was allegedly being implemented during the Cold War at the hands of the Bolshevik, Communist, Lenin, Marxist, Soviet, Red Scare, hide under your desk y'all, we're about to get nuked, boogeyman, the United States government alphabet agencies formed post-World War II were utilizing the same psychological tactics, not just on foreign nations, but on regular old unsuspecting Americans. In the early 1950s, the Central Intelligence Agency used major media companies for propaganda purposes in order to sway public opinion during the Cold War, a move right out of Bernie's playbook. This program was known as Operation Mockingbird, and in addition to controlling executives, reporters, and other staff within major media companies, the CIA also put forth their own agents as journalists of the so-called free press. Journalists who worked around the clock, especially after the assassination of President Kennedy, doing their patriotic duty to suppress truth from the American people, forcing witnesses to change their story, and silencing those who question the official narrative. Meanwhile, during that same time, the Federal Bureau of Investigation established their own counterintelligence program with the intention of surveilling, infiltrating, discrediting, and disrupting domestic political organizations, or basically any groups or individuals they deemed problematic. COINTELPRO's greatest hits, no pun intended, included infiltrating civil and women's rights movements and even groups who protested the Vietnam War. They went above and beyond, infiltrating groups and dismantling them by creating inner conflicts amongst members. Aggressive surveillance, character attacks published by the Mockingbird media, and if all that didn't work, the FBI would attempt to break up marriages and push an individual to suicide. Both the FBI's COINTELPRO and the CIA's Operation Mockingbird were reportedly terminated in the 1970s, but the manipulation of the masses certainly didn't end with these programs. While newspaper, radio, and television dominated the first age of information, the computer age ushered in the second installment. In 1960, the United States Department of Defense began awarding contracts for what would now be considered the primitive internet. And in 1989, the World Wide Web as we know it, the same tool that billions of people utilize to this day, was developed by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, also known as CERN. In 1984, only 8.4% of American households had a computer, rising to 36% in 1997, and in 2015, 
87%. In 2018, 95% of Americans reported owning a cell phone, and of that 95%, 77% reported owning a smartphone, meaning that the vast majority of Americans have a plethora of information at their fingertips at any given moment. In a few clicks, they can educate themselves on any topic imaginable connect to individuals thousands of miles away, and learn about events before the news even has a chance to report on them. So much information and so little regulation. That's what Harvard Law Professor and President Obama's Administrator of the White House Office of Information was probably thinking nearly a decade ago when he started publishing his tactics to control the flow of information online. In an academic paper he wrote in 2008, Cass Sunstein managed to marry elements of Edward Bernays' manipulation of the masses with a touch of Operation Mockingbird and a dash of COINTELPRO tactics in order to counter information online that he suggested was a threat to the United States government. Sunstein defined conspiracy theories as an effort to explain some event or practice by references to the machinations of powerful people who attempt to conceal the role at least until their aims are accomplished. While Sunstein admitted that some conspiracy theories are true, making them just conspiracies, like Project MK Ultra, Watergate, Operation Northwoods, and the Bush administration illegally spying on US citizens after 9-11, he still advocated his policy for silencing conspiracy theorists saying that governments should engage in the cognitive infiltration of the groups that produce conspiracy theories. And rather ironically, Sunstein recommended that government officials should utilize conspiratorial means to accomplish this, taking on false identities or even anonymity in online social networks, chat rooms, and in person to undermine individuals and groups who investigate, discuss, and propagate theories. Though, it's curious. Sunstein didn't take aim at any other fallible variety of theory that resulted in harm to someone, somewhere. Scientific theories got a free pass. Sunstein's message can be boiled down to the following. If you outspokenly call for transparency in government and circulate research about events that might or might not have transpired or might not have happened the way the Mockingbird media said they did, Sunstein says the government doesn't trust you and therefore you need to be dealt with. Let us all take a moment of silence for Cass Sunstein. Press F to pay your respects, as he is a victim of ideological subversion, or at least we hope so, because his treasonous and despicable behavior is otherwise inexcusable. While I'd like to tell you that Sunstein's efforts and the efforts of those before him to control the flow of information online have been unsuccessful, it only takes a quick glance at the present to recognize their fruit. Dissenting voices are silenced every day online for expressing even the most lukewarm controversial opinion, whilst appointed arbiters of truth are pushed into the public eye under the guise of being independent or alternative media. Today, only six companies control 90% of the American media outlets and one company has the monopoly on the main gateway to the treasure trove of information the World Wide Web has to offer. That company is Google, owned by Alphabet Inc. The lines between corporations and governments aren't just blurred anymore. They barely exist at all. And just when people start to take notice that something isn't quite right, another distraction gets ruled out. Probably some breaking news headline on a polarizing issue into which well-meaning people throw their energy. Social media then becomes weaponized, dividing people into virtual armies that endlessly attack each other. White versus black, men versus women, Muslims versus Christians, gay versus straight, Antifa versus the alt-right. Ugh, it's all so draining. So why don't you just sit back, relax, and watch a little Netflix? A company founded by none other than the grandnephew of Edward Bernays. And that is how the internet became a battlefield in the war on our minds. Thank you so much for watching, internet friends. You know I always look forward to your comments. Thank you so much for subscribing and supporting my channel on Patreon. Bye!